Hello everyone, this is the secret life of... What? <laughs> Wait, you forgot the name again? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Hello everyone, this is the secret life of pawns and today we're going to take a look at games where we have rigid pawn structures in rook and games. So the first one I want to show is the classical game between Capablanca and Tartakover. This classical game. And this will be very important um, to know for future reference and the future games I'm going to show you. b4, e6. Well, the opening doesn't really matter. It's actually the stonewall variation. But <clears throat> we're mostly headed towards the end game, and that's the point where we're more interested in here. b6, classical stuff, knight e4, exchanges. Now, white has a doubled pawn, but is compensated with the idea of e4 breaks. So white has fairly good chances to get an advantage, although it has the problem of having these double pawns as a disadvantage. e4, bishop takes f3. Well, even though this is not our main topic, but just getting rid of your bishop for no reason is usually not a great idea. So I would say that knight c6 must have been much better. But whatever. Tartakover played bishop takes f3, takes knight c6, rook b1, rook g8. Let's just fast forward to the important part, g3, king f8. And <clears throat> let's just stop here. This is kind of a critical position for the game Capablanca Tartakover. And even though there's no direct threat that Capablanca can uh, do in this position, but he still needs to come up with a plan here. So what type of plans could White come up in this position? Let's check on weakness side. Yeah, uh, we can, as you point out, we can put a lot of pressure on this guy or make a second weakness. Now, chess is a game of decisions. We have to decide which one we want to do. C5 could be a little bit risky in the sense that our king will get a little weak as well. <coughs> yes, h4, h5. And actually, Capablanca played g2 and now h4. He played the preparatory king g2 first, just to make sure that there won't be any checks in the upcoming future, and after that he played h4. Now, as pointed out, h5 is the threat. But it's also grabbing some space and asking the question from Tartakova, what are you going to do about it? So Tartakova decided to do some action. And if your opponent plays on the side, you usually play in the center. So he played d5. Capablanca has to take, because, for example, if white is not careful, takes, takes, and then this nasty check would double attack both the bishop and the king. So that's a no-no. But Capablanca is a great player. He doesn't fall for these cheapos. So he takes on d5, takes d5, takes, 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 takes. And how did Capablanca continue here? Still h5, of course. If you start a plan, you try to continue with that. Rook f6. Tartakover doesn't want to take on h5, because then rook h1 comes. And then Capablanca would just take all the pawns. And may, might even look at the d5 pawn as well. Let's say c6, which looks a bit weird. It does defend the d5 pawn, though. But then, in that case, the h7 pawn will fall. And that's a problem. So Tartakover plays rook f6. h takes, h takes, rook h1. 
Okay, let's stop here. How could we assess this position with light? Do we like, yeah? Close to win. Already. Close to win? Why do you feel it's close to win? Because it's seven to five. Yeah. So, for one thing, it's pointed out correctly that the knight is stranded on a5. Black also has weaknesses on g6. This rook is entering the seventh rank. We have two pawns against one, and we have a bishop against the knight in an open position. So, Capablanca should be able to win this position. So rook h1, king f8, rook h7, rook c6. But Tartakova is fighting. He's trying to have some ghost threats. I'm saying ghost threats because rook takes c3 doesn't really threaten much because bishop g6, then these pawns start rolling and then it will be over. So Tartakova can never take on c3. So he brings his knight back to the game g5. <clears throat> this g5 idea feels kind of similar to the idea played between Lasker against the same guy who's white, Capablanca, just making sure that this pawn on g6 will become an eternal weakness. So Tartakova gives a check. <coughs> King f3. Knight f5. And here, Capablanca is at choice what to do. How should white proceed in this position? <coughs> I like to take knight to mm -hmm. go to h4, h5, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one idea is to take on f5 and just march up with the king. <coughs> yeah, black was defending quite well though, because now rook takes c3 is a real threat. Yeah, and the d4 pawn also falls as well. <coughs> so indeed, Capablanca chose to take, g takes, and king g3. And we'll see that even though black will be a pawn up, that doesn't really matter that much. King h4, rook f3. How should white continue here? G6. So in general, in these rook end games, it's really the quality of the pawn that matters and not the quantity. And also this king is way superior to this passive king on f8. Rook f4, king g5, rook e4, king f6. And now this is very, very uncomfortable for black. One thing, rook h8 is mate, but also this pawn is very, very close to promoting. So Tartakova played king g8, checks first. So he asked this decision, because the king is too well placed on g8. <clears throat> he wants to know where Tartakova wants to bring that king. Because if king f8, that's kind of running into a potential check with g7. And if h8, then mating ideas will be up in the air. <clears throat> so rook takes c7. Already, we have the second threat of mating. Rook e8, king takes f5. And again, now material equality is restored. But there are huge differences between the activity of the pieces. This rook is a demigod on the seventh rank. This king is just monstrous on f5. While these black pieces are, oh, are pretty bad. Rook e4, king f6. Notice that any time black tries to get active, Capablanca says no, no, and forces black to go back to pass passive defense. Rook f4, king e5, rook g4. How did Capablanca continue here? G7 check. Yeah, g7 check. A little bit of calculation, because yeah. obviously rook g7 just loses, as takes, takes, king d5, and after g6, 
King c6, the pawn starts rolling, and that's an easy win for white. <clears throat> so King g8 was forced. Rook takes a7. And now all the pawns fall, and black is just ultimately lost. Rook c1, king d6, and black is just waiting, but time is up, and <coughs> the pawn just promotes. So that was a very nice textbook way of playing these endgames. And one of the big students of Capablanca is Korchnoi. Korchnoi loved to study all the greats, and he always noticed these little intricacies that Capablanca and other greats use in their games. So this is an early encounter, in fact, between Korchnoi and Karpov. They played it in a Soviet championship. It's a few years before they actually played their match. So Karpov played h6. And obviously, we can see that white is much better for quite a few reasons. Can we mention a few of them? Pawn on e6. Yeah, the pawn on e6 is extremely weak. The bishop is the structure of queen yeah. side. The structure is just amazing for white. And we have this very good e5 pawn just pushing black to the 7th and 8th rank. Also, notice that rook takes e5, which would be a neat little tactic, doesn't work because of rook takes d7 check. And if you take it with either of those pieces, you'll just lose a piece. So h6 is played. <coughs> now we'll have to find a good plan for Korchnoi. Whenever we get these bind kind of positions, we'll have to keep in mind that our opponent badly wants to untangle themselves. So we're kind of trying to keep the cat in the box. We need king. We need the king, yeah. But what is Karpov aiming with that h6 move? Can anybody help me with that? What does he want with that? Partly waiting, but when you have little to no space, you want to gain some. And that's actually what Karpov is looking for. He's kind of hinting at g5. I'm not saying that this is a brutal threat that Korchnoi really has to worry about, but it's a way of gaining space. So Korchnoi doesn't like activity from his opponents, H4. so he plays h4. So he keeps Karpov in the box. <coughs> rook a8, and now rook e3. He can't really go to g3 right now, because the e5 pawn is a bit hanging, but it never hurts to have a threat like rook g3. Rook c6. And now comes the tough question, whether we should exchange or not. Fortunately, decides not to exchange. And in fact, that's kind of the rule. If you have more space, exchanges favor the one who has less space. So Korchnoi wants to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. Rook c5. Rook c5. And he changed his plan, which is kind of surprising. I guess he realized that this pressure on e5 is just too annoying, so he has no other choice than to change his plans and exchange instead. <coughs> but Korchnoi still follows the plan of pushing black off the board. How did Korchnoi do that? Rook g3. So already hitting on g7, also planning a move of rook g6, which is not a big threat, but is a threat. So rook g8. <coughs> then rook d6. 
Rook g6, I assume bishop d7 or something. Then king comes to c5. Yeah. yeah. In fact, Viktor Korchner did it immediately. Oh. He went king f2. Yeah. yeah. And in the upcoming moves, we'll see oh, yeah. that king. Plus one more tempo. Yes, that plus one more tempo. And also, we'll see them king go and just win the battle for the whole white army. g5. King e3. Korchnoi is confident that nothing is going to happen on the king side because he has full control. Black can never take because of the rook dropping. And also g4 would just create another weakness for Karpov. But he had no choice and played g4 anyways. But Korchnoi keeps on marching. King d4, h5, king c5. <coughs> And we can see again the differences between the king will decide this game. Otherwise, it would be roughly even because neither of these rooks are too good. Both of them are fairly passive. Bishop e4, king b6. And again, <clears throat> this active king which you should only do when it's an endgame. Otherwise, this would be fairly risky to do. It's kind of powerful, because the only way black can defend this pawn is to move the rook there. Bishop d3, bishop f5, rook e3. So Victor Korchnoi's plan is now simple. He wants to get rid of the bishops and then go around with the rook. But sometimes plans change. And then he would never want this rook to enter his position. So therefore, he cuts off that uh, line. Bishop c2, king b5, rook a8, rook e2. But he slowly does the maneuver anyways. Now he plays g3. So the pawns will all be on black. And in this way, Karpov will never have any chance to gobble them up. Bishop f5, rook d2. And <clears throat> there's very hard to stop ideas of rook d6, rook a6. And in fact, that just happens and wins the game. King b6, rook d7 takes, king takes b4. And one pass pawn is not the end of the world, but when there are two Connected ones, that's just too much. a5, rook g1, rook c2, g3, rook a2. Just use, using the old classical method of supporting the pass pawn from behind so the pawn can freely launch forward while also defending against a g2 move. Rook h1, Karpov is quick to give up on the idea of g2. Because after a6, there's no way you can push this g pawn, because I would just take the pawn on g2, as mentioned before. So he plays rook h1, a6, takes king c3, rook h3. Some little tricks, but it don't work. And after rook g2, this pawn is just way too advanced, and it's just going to promote in the upcoming moves. So Karpov resigned. So all in all, what we learned from the first two games, it's very important to activate your king because it might be the only way to win the position. So let's take a look at the match, Korchnoi Karpov, which was played in 1978. And yeah, Bagoyo. And this one will be a classical orthodox system, which is very solid, but a slight bit passive. These are just the main moves. It's all theory. Bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6. And in fact, bishop takes f6 was preparing an idea which is very classical in these type of orthodox structures. Can anybody tell me what is that? It's the classical idea of minority attack. Yes, of course. 
So the idea of minority attack, just to launch forward the pawns and probe for weaknesses. Bishop g4, knight d2. Now, <clears throat> usually we're easy and we give our knights away for bishops, but technically this is a closed position, so Korchnoi decides to keep the knights instead. Rook c8, and now Korchnoi comes up with a very interesting concept that not many white players know in this type of position. It's not necessarily a hard move, but I don't see it too often. Can anybody guess what Korchnoi played here? No? no? Bishop f5. Yeah, Bishop f5. So, yeah, pretty straightforward, but it's, in fact, I feel a rare idea. Usually white thinks that this bishop is a burden for black, but is also a very good defender when it comes to defending the c6 pawn. So Korchnoi decides, I want to hit these weak spots. So I play bishop f5, get rid of your best defender, and just play on your weaknesses. Queen d7, queen takes d7. Korchnoi is not afraid of getting into an endgame. He's confident that he'll be able to squeeze this position to the maximum. a4. Bishop e7, we are not giving that pawn for free. Knight f6. <clears throat> and here, Korchnoi comes up with a concept not as known at that time. We will not do the regular way of attacking the position b5, but he'll go a5. a5. And the plan will come clear very soon. a6, and we can already sense that this b7 pawn will become extremely weak in the long run. Now it's not an easy job getting close to that pawn though. But we'll have to do, yes, the regular plan of jumping to a4 and then to c5 to capture this important square. Bishop f8, knight c5, rook e7. Obviously, Karpov is not even thinking about taking, because that would be the end of it. I'm just going to double here, and this weakness will just prove fatal for black. So Karpov stays put and defends the b7 pawn. And now, Korchnoi shows something that in our modern days is not so usual, he shows signs of patience. He knows that he has constant pressure in these positions, so he need not rush. And he keeps to his plans. Knight e8, coming up with this classical plan of posting the knight on d6, where it will be very well placed. King e2, knight d6, king d3. <clears throat> So I made this position slightly better for white, maybe equal, but white is the one pushing and trying to probe for more weaknesses in black's position. Now the first question is, how can we probe in this position with white? It's more of a strategical position, so we can think long term here. What will be the ultimate plan for white to open up the position. What will be the crucial breakthrough? Well, yeah, white will push some pawns to get some space, but there's one pivotal square that white will need to have a firm grip on. No, not, not b6. D5. d5, well, d5 is protected. Oh, b5. B5, not really, because that's very, very protected by those pawns. So we're not going to be able to cross through there. E5, e e5 is a bit far away, but we're getting closer. 
we'll have to make a pawn break. B5 by itself. Yeah, B5 doesn't really work. So which square is the square that is kind of guarded by our knights? Uh, E4. E4. And he, yes. Even though <coughs> not the knight on d6 and the rook on e7 has some pressure on it, in the long term, white will have enough resources to push through there. But as a big of a professional Korchnoi is, he will wait till the last second to make the break e4. Rook a8, rook e1. This is just the first sign that I'm defending this pawn. I'm not telling you if I'm actually going to play f3 yet, but maybe, maybe it's in the air. g6, rook e2, f6, rook a e1. Just defending everything and seeing what Karpov is doing. Bishop h6. Karpov is heavily preparing against the idea of e4. Knight b3. Bishop f8. But it's tough to play this position with black, though, because all of the pieces black has is optimally placed. Now he will have to find waiting moves that don't ruin the position. So Karpov feels that everything's in order. I'll just go back to f8. Knight d2, bishop h6, h3. Korchnoi stops jumping around with his horses and decides that the knight on d2 will be better off placed there as it will support the idea of e4. King f7, g4. Just as mentioned, white is gaining some space on the king side. Bishop f8, f3. And as the bishop moves away, he plays the move f3. Rook d8. So, Karpov changes tack, and he's trying to jump to b5 and hit on the potentially weak square of d4 in an event of e4. Now, it's not necessarily working, but it might dissuade Korchnoi. Well, Korchnoi feels that he has a lot of time, so he's moving around with his knights a little bit more. Knight b5, rook f1. Bishop h6, f4, <clears throat> gaining even more space and might even dream of ideas of g5 or f5 to pin down black's position. Now f5 would be even better because in that case the knight can jump to e6 and have that lovely square used as an outpost for the knight. f4, bishop f8, Knight d2, knight d6, rook e1, h6, rook f1, just waiting. Rook b8, rook a1, rook a8, rook a1. And now as Karpov moved his rook from that great square, Korchnoi decides, okay, I achieved the ultimate position. It won't be any better than this. So it's time for e4. Move now to 41. So after like 20 moves of waiting, he decides. Yeah, that they also have a um, sealed move at this moment. But he was still patiently grinding Karpov in this position, waiting for the right moment to break. Yes. but. It is true, thank you for mentioning that. At this moment, there was such a thing as a sealed move, so Karpov wouldn't know Korchnoi's move, and, it, and he will see the next move that will be played on the next day in an envelope, and the arbiter will open it up and show that it was e4. And at this moment, seconds would be preparing for potential lines that would be played in 1978, so times are changing. Seconds are doing more works with computers now. e4, d takes e4, knight e4. And now white is still better. We can state that because this knight is just eternally better than this bishop on f8. 
So maybe it's not that much of an advantage, but it's something that Korchnoi will try to nurse to victory. Knight b5, knight c3. So Korchnoi senses that there'll be too much pressure on this pawn on d4. So he plays knight c3, gets rid of this nasty, nasty beast on b5. Takes e2, takes e2. Bishop takes c5. Notice that Karpov seizes the best moments to get rid of that pesky knight on c5 or that very passive bishop on f8. Takes rook d8, knight b5, a takes b5. And we reach the end game. And we're le getting very, very close to the end game we first saw between Capablanca and Tartakover. Obviously, it's a different structure, but we'll learn later why it's important to know these great predecessors. So he plays f5, takes, takes. And the idea of f5 is potentially creating a weakness on h6, also kind of playing against that king on f7, because if White would make a hasty move like rook a2. Black could potentially start rolling in with the king, with the idea of king d5, or just with the simple plan of coming over. And that the position would be near or close to equal. Therefore, Horchner plays f5, takes 6, rook g8, trying to get active, king c3. Rook e8, rook d2. Why does Korchnoi play rook d2? <clears throat> what is the plan Korchnoi is looking for here? Yeah? Yeah, he needs, he needs to open some lines, but he also wants to get into a rook endgame. As you mentioned, if we exchange rooks, it's just a drawn endgame. So he plays rook d2, rook e4. King b4. And now that's the reason it's useful to learn about other games from great endgame players because we will guess the best move from Korchnoi in this position. What did Korchnoi play here? In fact, if we think about it, it kind of mirrors the position of Capablanca Tartakover. A6, of course. And as Korchnoi learned from his studies, there's nothing as important than having an active king. So he gives up the pawn just to get a king closer to this weak c6 pawn. Also, the king is headed to b6. <clears throat> King d7, Karpov is trying to oppose that. But he's one tempo short, and the king comes to b6. b4, how should we continue here? Push, yes. Pawn push, d5. Takes, takes, king c8. And even though Karpov managed to find a good spot for the king, it's still in danger just like in the game between Capablanca and Tartakover. Now, in rook end games, it's not that easy to play those positions because you have to nurse your own pawns while also stopping any potential pawn moves by your opponent. How did Korchnoi manage to do both? Yeah, rook d3. And now rook d3 is important for two reasons. Well, one of them is obviously to stop this pawn from marching. What could be the other reason? Yes, to activate the rook. Because apart from having an active king, it's very important to have an active rook. <coughs> So black played a5, which wasn't good. He needed to play something like rook c4 and rook c3 
and then Carpa would have some type of chances of surviving, although it's already a tough position if you don't have a computer, because all of Korchnoi's pieces are very well placed, and it takes just few mistakes for Karpov to get in big trouble. So A5, what was Korchnoi's next move? Yeah, it is either c6 or rook g3. That he is the big. Yeah, he, he didn't do both. He decided between one of them. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, why would you march the pawn? Applies a little more pressure. Mm -hmm. So, it would apply a little more pressure. Why would you bring your rook to g3 instead of pushing the pawn? Yeah. Yeah, both of them look very dangerous. But I like the fact that White played rook g3. And I think the reason why this is very strong now, because in endgame, stampies are very important. If whatever, I'll just make a demonstrative move. h5 is obviously not the move to play here. But if I check, c6 will come with a check. And that's very important. In rook end games that every move you make is a forcing move. Therefore, you can gain some time. So if you play c6 immediately, you won't get that extra tempo. Meaning, rook g3 forces Karpov to do something right now. If you play c6, black is not forced to do anything at the moment. But rook g3, g3 with the idea of rook g8, will force black to react. So he plays b3, and now Korchnoi comes up with a brilliant move, and which I think surprised Karpov. <coughs> King c6, yes. And many times people think that it's just about pawn races in rook end games, but it's not the case. In fact, in rook end games, Playing with your king is as important as being uh, strategic with your pawn movements. King c6. And now the problem is for black that he either goes back, rook e8, but then I'll just take your pawn and then you'll have miserable pieces. Or if you move your king, I'll be able to take and again threaten ideas of rook b8 and start marching my pawn of either king d5 or king b7 and c6, c7. So this is very dangerous for black already. So king c6 again puts Karpov in, in some sorts of Sutswang. So he plays king b8, takes king a7. And in fact, this king b8, king a7 plan was again high class. Usually in end games on the fifth rank, they say that you should bring your king to the side. And that's just what Karpov does. Rook b7 check. Now rook b7 check is always a question if it's a good move or not. At the moment, black obviously wouldn't want to bring his king to a8. But after rook b7, Korchner asks the question, so you want to post your king on a8. That would be terrible for you, though. But if you go to a6 as he does, then Korchnoi wins a tempi with rook b6 check now. And again, he wins a pivotal tempo that will win him the game. King a7, king b5. And we can see that with every little checks and moves, Korchnoi gained a little bit of momentum. And that's how he outplayed slowly Karpov in this game. Now. The game is basically over and is soon is going to end because Korchner is just about to gobble up all the pawns black has. a4 takes, rook f4 takes. It's just too many pawns and it's not drawish enough because this king is very active again. While also this king is kind of far away, especially from this square. And actually, Black decided to resign here, which is understandable 
as I can just start marching my pawn. And in any case, black is helpless and just lost. All right, so before we end, I'll show two more games, one from Korchnoi and a later Karpov game, where Karpov will show how he plays the end games. He plays it pretty well. Now in this game, this was an earlier game by Korchnoi against Chirich. And black obviously wants to get rid of the queens. Now, Victor Korchnoi will decide how to continue here. White has actually two options. What should white consider here? K1 is one of them. Second is to take on A6. And we'll have to decide which one favors us as white. <coughs> yeah, Rook A1 was played. The reason Korchnoi doesn't take on A6, Bishop takes A6, is the fact that he's not too keen on seeing this bishop posted on c4. Because if that bishop manages to drop on c4, he could start pushing the pawns, and black might get enough counterplay. So therefore, Korchner plays rook a1, takes, takes. And again, this is this rigid type of pawn structure White is not much better. His structure is very good. On the other hand, the reason White will have very good winning chances is the fact that these pawns on b6 and d5 are terrible. And they're very hard to defend. So Chirich doesn't like the idea of seeing this rook go ballistic on the seventh rank. So he plays rook b8. Now, <clears throat> it's not yet over. Chirich is still fighting, so Korchnoi will need to find a very, very good move here to stop any kind of counterplay from black. Bishop f1 is a way to stop it. There's many ways. You have to decide which one is best. Mm -hmm. Why would you play bishop d7? Looks right. Mm -hmm. In here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was your opinion? Why would you prefer? prefer? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Indeed. Bishop d7 is much more active. And yeah, it first and foremost stops any kind of bishop moves. Bishop c6 stops the pawn, so has the control over that b5 square, and also a very powerful paralyzing move by Viktor Korchnoi. King f8, king f1. And now Chirich realized the king can't come closer because bishop c6 wins on the spot. So in fact, black is an internal tsutswang, meaning black can't do anything right now. He's just doomed to wait. So g, g6, how should we continue? Just the king's run, king runs, yeah? Yeah, the king just runs. King g7, king b3, king f6, f3. Well, as we see, Korchnoi loves this idea of advancing his central pawns. And this is also a very good idea. Because in general, if you get two connected pass pawns, and s as soon we will see, that's near winning. Or at least it gives you a hefty advantage that you could try to milk till win. Rook b7, rook takes a8, takes rook b8. 
Now, sadly again, there's no such move as rook d6, because check, and you'll part with your rook. So rook d6, I'll just play e5 and win your rook. So rook a7 is played, takes rook b2. And now this is a very professional way of playing an endgame. Korchnoi takes away all the possible counterplay that black could get. So he first defends this pawn chain on h2 and g3 before doing any action. Rook a3, where should we go with our king? C4. Obviously, in endgames, a king is a very, very important piece as it's part of the attack. White wants to support this pawn on d4 with the king. Rook a4, king d5, rook a5, king c6. So you can see this usual way of slaloming up, slaloming up to c6, which is a usual way to bring your king up in a rook endgame. Rook a6 check, rook b6. Korchnoi decides that the king is worth it's well positioned on c6. Rook a4, check. Asking where your king wants to be. King f6, check again. King e6, d5. And now Korchnoi decides that this d pawn is just so powerful that it's just going to win the game. King takes e5. How should we continue here? This is actually a critical moment. Check. The position. Check. It's very important, if you can and you get the chance, cut off your opponent's king. And that way, the chance of you winning is very likely. King f6. Well, if the king goes behind the pawn, why just starts pushing the pawn, and this king will just be a nuisance and end the way. Because usually, black would try to check white, and also the king would be much happier to be in front than behind. So Chirich plays king f6, rook e2. And now this king is eternally blocked from entering the queen side, where this pawn resides. Rook c4, king b5, d6. Rook d1, king c6, h5, d7, king f5, king c7. And there's no real way of stopping white from marching the pawn up. Because if you keep checking, I'll still go king c7, king d8, and then d7. Obviously, I'll defend the d6 pawn along the way. And after that, let's say, let, let's give a check here, here, check. I'll go king d8 now, so I can go d7. And if you make some move, I go king e8, and now I promote. So there's no real way for just this one rook to stop me, because my king will be very safe on e8, partly due to this rook on e2, because there's no rook e1 checks ever, because it's protected by e2 knight, the e2 rook. So Black played h5, but after d7, king c7, this is just too slow. And the white king just comes back in time and will take all the pawns here on the queen side. The Korchnoi won. That was a very nice way of showing that <coughs> in these rigid structures, first you want to create a bind, and then you slowly want to push your opponent off the board. And in fact, it was also very important to create a pass pawn with f3, e4. That's one thing to remember. In an endgame, especially a rook endgame, you want to create pass pawns. And last but not least, let's see another big expert on endgames, and that's, of course, Anatoly Karpov. d4, d5. It's going to be a very classical system. But again, we're not really interested in the opening phase. We are more interested in the end game that will arise after that. Bishop d3, c5, a5. And now, <clears throat> what Yusupov plays is a defensive system. <coughs> and
and he's trying to hold off Karpov from entering his position. He's trying to hold his position together, and Karpov is trying to breach, breach it. So as our rooks are poised to enter the seventh rank, how should we try to get there anyways? Put more pressure on c5. In fact, Karpov chose to take first, knight c5, and chose a plan to get rid of this good knight on c5. Repeat? Knight d4, knight b3. Knight d4, knight b3. Yeah, they, yeah. Karpov found the most optimal and active way of getting rid of the c5 knight. Knight d2, knight e4. That's the way. Karpov decided to go knight e5. <coughs> and to go to d3. He wants to occupy bits and pieces of the d-line while also having a firm control on this line. So queen f6, knight d3, rook d8. Now Yusupov is trying to play for a counterplay. Takes, takes, queen e2. Karpov obviously doesn't want to take here because rook takes b2 and this will be very painful now because this rook would become extremely active and Karpov would take a pawn that he shouldn't have taken. So queen e2, rook d7, Rook c2. So Karpov first guards against all these tactical ideas that would be in the way. a4, g3. So slowly, white is trying to advance. In the long term, Karpov wants to attack the pawn on c5 and this pawn on a4. But look how he does it. Rook d5, king g2. Just slowly improving all his pieces g6, a3. Now, we see these moves, a3, and we saw this kind of bind moves in the Korchnoi Karpov game where he played f5, if you remember, just pushing black off the board. Also, making sure that this pawn will be an eternal weakness. And that's very important. So h5, queen f3. And Karpov is consciously going for the endgame. Queen e5. Yusupov tries to stop that idea, but that's not going to happen in this game as Karpov double attacks on e5 and a4 at the same time. Queen f4, g takes, rook b8, rook c5. And Karpov decides that one pawn up is good enough for him. And he'll go on and try to win this game. Now, this is a very typical position known from games like Leiko Anand. The big difference being it, it's usually three against three in those positions. And those are officially considered drawn. But four against four is not drawn, is a win for white. King f8, rook a7. Obviously, Karpov doesn't want to see, doesn't want to see a king coming closer. Rook a1, h4. Just blocking any ideas of just coming down the board with h4 and h3. King g7, a4, king f3. Just getting extra tempies as he can. a5, rook a3, a6. Now he pushed his pawn up to a6 because he feels that in the long term, the way to win this position is to use this a pawn to full effect and in fact trying to queen it with the help of the king. Rook a2, king d3. And this is actually the same method that they try to use in the three against three end games. You push your pawn up to a6 or as far as you can do it. Usually not to a7 because that's often very drawish. And just bring the king over. Rook b7, rook a2, a7. And as this rook is very active, the position is very favorable for Karpov. The only thing left to do for him is to just come up with, your, with the king, go behind it, and just promote. Or just go king b6 and rook b8. Which could be even better, because the closer your king is to your pawns, the more likely black can't get any counter chances. 
So Yusupov is trying something, trying to open up the position, but Karpov is unfazed. He takes the pawn, king e6, king c4, g5. He is actually trying to get some counterplay. h4, king b5, rook b2, king c6. Some checks, king c7, h3, king b8. And Karpov achieved his goal, and after h2, rook b1, Yusupov resigned. And this is a very proficient way of playing the endgame. He gained every tempi he could get. He blocked the weakness on a4, as we saw before. And with very meticulous play, Karpov nursed his advantage to a win. And that's how you should play rigid structures. Thank you. Thank you.